So I'll start out by saying uh, welcome everyone. I'm Peggy West. I'm with Smart Cams, which is the name I put for the 2023 webinars for this year. And um, I am also the organizer for today's webinar, 2023 mm -hmm. Attorney Jamboree. Um, I had a vision about this idea at the end of the year because I felt like in 2022, I didn't have enough attorney classes. So I thought, well, let's kick it off with all the attorneys, different topics, and let's get ready to go for the year. So um, everyone, when you wanna speak with someone about a legal question, what do you do? You call an attorney. So we're gonna have all different topics today. And uh, before we get started, I want to uh, show appreciation for our sponsors who invited you all, and they're gonna say a few words. So let's get started with introducing Ventium Software. Uh, I have Layla Scola on. She is the wind beneath my wing. She helps me. We work together, IT specialist, uh, everything from inviting you. She is the head of customer relations and marketing at Ventium. Uh, tell us about yourself and about the company. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, yes, I've been with Ventium for four years now, and I'm the head of customer success and marketing. Ventium has been in the market for almost 10 years and we work with two different products. The first is Neighbors, where it's an award-winning communication and management platform for HOAs and condos. So create a website and communicate with your residents all in one place. And the other is Inspections, which is a secure, easy to use software to help you with your property inspections. And I'll leave my information in the chat. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. And thank you for all you do. And I wanna make an honorable mention to Yasmin Johannes, her right hand, uh, marketing manager as well. And please be sure and thank her. Uh, next, I wanna introduce our moderator for today, Rudy Martin. He is the Director of Strategic Business Development and uh, he is with M2 Engineering. Rudy, tell us about yourself and the company. Thank you, Peggy. So M2E is a consulting engineer we deal with property condition assessments, concrete restorations, of course, the milestone and structural integrity reserves, also some of the turnover um, services that we provide. And because this is the uh, Jamboree, um, we also do turnover services and construction litigation support and expert witnesses. Uh, so if you're in that situation, please reach out to us. I am moderating this event. There is a Q&A button in the bottom of your screen. If you have a question, please click the Q&A to ask a question. The chat is just for positive comments and smiley faces. So please keep all of the questions um, in the Q&A box. This is being recorded, so it will be available to you after this. Everyone's name on here will be sent out on a list after this uh, presentation. So you have everyone's contact information. So um, thank you for joining us and we're looking forward to another exciting webinar. Great, thanks Rudy. Okay, uh, next I want to introduce uh, Rudy Forehand. He's a regional manager for this area for Benjamin Moore. Rudy, tell us about yourself and Benjamin Moore for the associations. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you everybody for attending. Uh, Rudy Forham with Benjamin Moore Paints. Um, I work along with uh, Regal Paints. They have 21 stores from Orlando down to Fort Lauderdale. So we cover all your needs. We sell paint. We sell paint for all your inside outside needs. Paint is the first line of protection for your building or your community. So be aware of that when you're picking colors, as you see in the back, we, I'm big with colors. We do color consultations, but we work with big projects as well. Uh, doing uh, specifications. So, you know, we, I like to say we do uh, project uh, planning, uh, kind of uh, working with you and uh, do, 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 the, do these big jobs with you. So, but if you need anything with paint, give me a call. Uh, my information will be in that sheet that Rudy, the other Rudy was talking about. And I'll be more than happy to help with you and uh, do anything we can. Thank you and uh, enjoy the, uh, the, the seminar. Great, thanks Rudy. Uh, followed by Rudy is Chris Clark from Onion Painting and Waterproofing. Chris, are you on? I don't think he's here today. Oh, goodness. Okay. All right. Well, they are big customers and work uh, with Rudy Forehand at Benjamin Moore. So, uh, again, the information will be sent out. And next, let's move along to Hafer Company CPA Service. Uh, today, we have William or Bill Kilgallen on, he's a tax specialist. Tell us about yourself, Bill, and also about Hafer. Hey, thanks, Peggy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Bill Kilgallen with Hafer CPAs, 
Our firm serves over 750 associations. We provide audit, tax, and consulting services. On the audit side, most of you know, we've got three levels of audit services, compilations, reviews, and audits. And most associations are in the midst of issuing their financials for last year. And we can certainly answer any and all questions you may have in the realm of accounting, along with our best practice tips. So we'd be happy to schedule a call, a meeting, or a Zoom session. So please see our Hayford uh, CPA contact out in the chat area and have a great class, everyone. Thanks, Bill. Uh, please give our best to Nicole. Next, we have Dawn Miller. She's Director of Business Development for The Paving Lady. Dawn, tell us about yourself and the company. Hi. Hi, thank you, Peggy. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy New Year for starters. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Dawn with The Paving Lady. We are a full service asphalt contractor that's been in business since 1985. We do asphalt overlays, seal coating, striping, concrete curb and sidewalks. It's time of year for getting your budgets together because come rainy season, those potholes open up and the maintenance tends to happen over the summer for whatever reason, as we all know. But thanks for joining us again and enjoy the class. Have a great day. Thanks, Don. I feel better. <laughs> uh, next, you. we have John Gant. He is a partner at World One. Uh, John, introduce yourself and tell us about World One. Okay. Is John on? I don't see him on. Uh, gosh, okay, darn. Uh, John's kind of a new uh, sponsor for me, but they've been around for a long time. I want to say 20 years. They're recyclers. So again, you'll get his contact information. Uh, let's move along to Beth Garcia Swopa. She's a vice president at Brown and Brown Insurance. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Beth Garcia Swopa. I'm with Brown and Brown Insurance. I'm a 32 year agent. As you know, Brown and Brown does insure more associations in the state than many other brokers. Um, with all the challenges that are taking place now, which we'll speak to today, or our attorneys will speak to, uh, now's a good time to get ahead of your insurance. Um, you know, they think uh, shopping a lot of different agents with different markets is going to make a difference. We all have limited markets now. So you find an agent who works best for you, let them allow to work the markets um, and see what other options they can bring to the table. Now, you know, associations have to be a little more creative. You have, because of the cost increasing at a greater rate and assessments are becoming tougher for, as we know, the owners out there. So if I can do anything to help evaluate the insurance program or just give a free review, please feel free to contact me. I'll have my information in the contact app. Awesome, thank you, Beth. Busy awesome. time for you, I know. Okay, next we have uh, Ricardo Mancada. He's the chief consultant and a principal at RMS Building Envelope. Uh, tell us about yourself, Ricardo, and your business. Thank you, Peggy, and thanks everybody for being uh, with us this morning. Um, my name is Ricardo Moncada, and I've been in this industry for over 35 years. Our firm is a consulting firm. We're not contractors. We said, if you're a building owner or a, a board member or a property manager, we sit on your side of the table to protect you and guide you through the process, whether it's uh, the, the roof and, and building envelope management or the uh, renovation process of uh, your building assets. So uh, we can provide you with assessments, spec development, um, testing for permit, uh, the, the the beating process, the pre-construction, the quality assurance, the closeout. So we we walk with you through the entire process to make sure that your renovation projects are uh, done right, that nothing gets overstepped, and at the end you get the most value out of your roofing and waterproofing dollars. So um, if you have a need, you have a this is the perfect time, as Don was saying, before the rainy season to take a look at the condition of your buildings. So contact us, send us an email, and we'll uh, do a free consultation. We'll visit your building and uh, we'll take from there. Very good. Great service, uh, Ricardo. Okay, next we have uh, Suli, the Director of Business Development from DSS Condo. Uh, can you say a few words, Suli, and tell us about DSS? 
No, she's not on yet. Oh, goodness. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know if we'll have time to circle back. So let's see what happens. Uh, next, we have Patty J, partner over at J.R. Fraser Reserve Studies. Patty, tell us about yourself. Hey, and I, and I apologize for the name Patty. That's okay. actually Sandeep. That's my first <laughs> name. Uh, Patty just coordinated this in the office. But uh, okay. so, anyways, uh, the, the name of the company is J.R. Fraser. Uh, we do reserve studies. And we also do property and flood valuation for condominium buildings and commercial buildings. Um, we've been doing this for about 25 plus years. Uh, this year is going to be different because we're not really sure which way the structural integrity reserve study is going. So we've got some challenges ahead this year. But um, overall, I think it's going to be fine. Uh, we do simple HOA communities all the way up to 50 story condominium buildings. Um, one thing I always like to share on the property valuation side. Um, so I, you know, people here hear a lot of things about inflation and what inflation has done over the last two to three years. And I want to share this with everyone. Um, every year in January, I go into my system and I try to figure out what kind of inflation has taken place from the previous year. Uh, last year, the reconstruction value of buildings was close to 22 to 25 percent. On an average, years prior to, it ranged from two and a half during COVID to 3.8% inflation on an average. This year, since we're in January, I do that same analysis. It's about eight and a half percent. Just so everybody's in line with what is happening with inflation when it comes to reconstruction value of buildings. Um, and I'm sure everybody understands what's going on in the market, whether it's labor shortages or material shortages, but this is the kind of inflation. So if you've seen hikes in your insurance policy outside of just the policy increases, the other part most likely has to do with the tremendous amount of increase in the inflation uh, that has hit into the reconstruction uh, business, at least in the state of Florida. And, and we do business all the way from Port St. Lucie into, um, uh, into Key West, and then a little bit in Orlando and sometimes in Tampa as well. So this is this is just information I'd like to share, just to educate people. But thank you very much, and it was a pleasure being here. And, um, wish everybody enjoys um, this thing. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Beth Rappaport. She's Vice President of Business Development for Campbell Property Management. Beth, tell us about Campbell and yourself, please. Thank you, Peg, so much. Thank you for organizing this. It's a great idea, and you've done such a good job putting this together. And welcome everybody, happy new year. Thank you for joining us. I'm Beth Rappaport with Campbell Property Management. We've been in business since 1953 and we manage over 400 condos and HOAs from the Treasure Coast to Miami-Dade. Take a lot of pride in what we do and it shows in the retention our, in our employees and our customers and our online reviews. We are the highest rated property management company in South Florida. So I hope you enjoy today's event. And thank you again for attending. All right, thank you so much. Great company. All right, and last, uh, I have Lisa Elkin. She's the vice president uh, with Alliance Association Bank. Lisa, welcome and tell us about yourself and the bank. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and I hope we all learn some legal information today. I'm with Alliance Association Bank, and just remember our middle name says it all. We only do association deposits and loans all throughout the United States. But I want you to think of the A, B, and C when banking with me. A is association only products and services. That's all our bank does. B is better business financing for all your different capital improvement projects. And C is convenience, where we truly bring the resources of the bank to you. We have check scanners, and then we have our bank-owned lot box in Florida. So just remember with Lisa at AAB, it's one focus plus one expertise, and that equals time and money savings for your communities. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Awesome. So I hope I've provided uh, everyone a variety of sponsors uh, out in the audience that you can take a look at for new um, possible vendors to use in 2023. With that, I'll introduce by name and firm only the five attorneys that are going to be making presentations. Thank After you. the attorneys make their presentations, we will have an additional five minutes of questions that they will answer regarding their topic. And then 
Uh, any questions that you might have that are not on the topic, you may also ask in the chat box following all five attorneys and what I'm calling an open mic and Rudy uh, will uh, monitor that. So today we have, if you'll just raise your hands, uh, attorneys, Stephen Rappaport of Sax, Sax and Kaplan. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have Natalie Gutierrez of Peyton Bowen. Thank you. Then we have Scott Lee of SJW Law Group. Scott, thank you so much. Uh, we have Jeffrey Green of K Bender Rembaum. Thanks, Jeff. And we have Jeffrey Rembaum of K Bender Rembaum also. With that, I'll turn it over to the moderator, Rudy Martin. Take it away. Peggy, Peggy. Yes, I'm sorry. Let me, uh, you didn't uh, introduce me. Oh, I'm sorry, Jimmy. That's all right. You spoke when I got off track. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. That's all right. That's all right. I'm, I'm not an attorney, but I have been asked to play one on TV. Uh, <laughs> with that being said, <laughs> with that being it's said, that's right. right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Jimmy Gonzalez, I uh, am a an appointed election monitor. I also do the services privately for associations. So if you'd like to have um, uh, an election monitor conduct your election, we have additional services such as we will. Uh, write the notices for you. I actually bring admins with me, so we don't need any volunteers from the uh, from the association, which is a very, very good thing. Uh, so it's a very nice professional and neutral party to conduct your elections. I've been doing it now for the uh, ombudsman's office for uh, six years. So if you have uh, my information's in the chat box there, uh, I'd love to hear from you and we can schedule some appointments. It is the election season. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, sponsors. And thank you, of course, to the attorneys to make all this possible and for everybody who's attending. Thanks and have a great day. Thanks, Jimmy. And I do apologize. He is on the sponsor sheet. I know that for sure. So <laughs> good luck. OK, with that, let's turn it over to Rudy yep. and the first topic. So Steve Rappaport, you're up. All right. Thanks, Rudy. Thanks, everybody, for uh, having this event. Thanks to our sponsors. Um, on leasing an Airbnb. It's a pretty broad topic and with only five or so minutes to go through it, I'm going to try to hit some of the, the key points uh, that come across in my practice from time to time and some of the more important things that I think you should know. And starting off with, I think the most important thing that I want to stress is when you're thinking about doing a rental restriction, you really need to put it in your declaration. I can't tell you how many times I see rules and regulations trying to substantively uh, uh, amend the leasing restrictions. This is really something that needs to be in your most superior document. I suppose there may be some very limiting situations where you might be able to get away with doing some things in your rules, depending on the language of your declaration, if you have broad rulemaking authority. But the bottom line is that these are substantive leasing restrictions. They really need to be in the document that binds the use of the land, and that's your declaration. Uh, and for many other reasons, first of all, rules and regulations, they are judged on a reasonableness standard as opposed to your declaration, which is presumed to be valid and enforceable. And you don't want to have a rule that conflicts with a superior document like your declaration. And what I mean by that is um, your rules and regulations can't provide additional restrictions that conflict with anything that's in your declaration. And your declaration probably talks about leasing. So you don't want to put yourself in, a, in an enforcement pr uh, problem by putting something in your rules that conflicts with your declaration. And I know there are many declarations that don't have leasing restrictions in them. And I know many associations wanna put their re leasing restrictions in the rules where the declaration is silent, but I will caution you, for the most part, you can almost always find something in the declaration that will be a conflict. Even if it's a very simple statement in your easement provision that says that the property is for the use of the owners, their tenants, guests, and invitees. To me, even the mere mention of the word tenant without further restriction. That to me implies the ability of that owner to rent that unit without further restriction. So to put those restrictions in your rules, I think opens you up to, to challenge that it's a conflict. So again, point number one, try to get it in your declaration. I know that's gonna require some sort of majority, probably two thirds or even three quarters vote of the owners, but it's worth it. And it's, it's gonna make your life easier enforcing. Okay, so we've gotten to the point where we've accepted we need to get an amendment to the declaration what are the pitfalls? What are the problems with doing that? And unfortunately, there are a couple of statutory issues now for both uh, condos and HOAs with regard to leasing restrictions. It wasn't always the case for HOAs until about a year ago. It's been that way for condos. Um, so I want to go through these statutory issues because it's very important to keep these in mind when you're moving forward with a potential leasing restriction. Um, and of course, 
you might be asking, well, the language must be the same in 718 and 720, right? They, they, they would have to put the same language in both statutes because that would make sense. And of course, no, they did not. It couldn't be more different. So let's start with the condominiums first. For many, many years now, 718 has had language in it that has said that if you were trying to prohibit rentals, if you're trying to change the number of times a person can rent, or if you're trying to change the minimum lease term of a rental, it will only apply to those people who vote in favor of it or those who purchase or take title after it goes into effect. So it's sort of a grandfathering pr uh, provision for existing owners that if they don't want to vote in favor of something or if they're already in place, they're not going to be subject to those three specific types of leasing restrictions. And there's no exceptions to that in 718. So it's, again, prohibiting rentals, the number of times you can rent, or the lease term itself, changing the lease term that's acceptable to the association, that will only apply either to future owners or those who actually vote in favor of it and therefore bind themselves to that restriction. Now well, let's look at the HOA provision. What 720 now says, and this is as of 2021, so this is a very new development. Up until 2021, we were allowing HOAs to do anything that they wanted to do because people took title knowing that the documents could be amended from time to time and they took that as a risk. But now 720 has similar language to 718, but it's different in, in two very important ways. 720 now says that any amendment that prohibits or regulates leasing agreements will only apply to those who vote in favor of them or who purchase or take title after they go into effect. What does it mean to regulate a leasing agreement? I mean, arguably that's pretty broad. It certainly means changing the lease terms, changing the number of times you can rent or prohibiting leasing, but does that also mean having a screening process, charging a screening fee, charging security deposits, having an approval. I and mean, there's certainly arguments to be made that any of those types of restrictions could relate to regulating the leasing agreement itself. So in my opinion, 720 is much more broad than 718 and what you can do uh, in, in applying it to existing owners, but with an exception. And this is interesting that 720 has this exception. You can amend your documents for an HOA to provide for a minimum lease term of, uh, of at least six months or to provide for no more than three rentals in a year and that will apply to everybody. So think of what you have here. You have condos where you have explicitly three things you can't do yet you can't apply except for those who vote in favor of it or future owners. HOAs you have pretty much almost anything you can't do except these two things six months or less or three times or more a year you can do for everybody. So this is creating a lot of confusion. It makes absolutely no sense why these two provisions are, are different. I, I'm hopeful that in the next year or so, we're gonna see a glitch bill that maybe makes these identical. My hope would be for the 718 language on the three things to be put into 720, and then for the exceptions for short-term rentals to be put into 718 so that they're both consistent on, on both parts, but we'll, we'll see what the legislature does. But again, keeping in mind that if, whether you're a condo or an HOA, if you're thinking about doing a leasing restriction, be very careful in what you're doing and understand that it may only apply moving forward futuristically or to those people that actually bind themselves by voting in favor of it. Stephen, we've got a lot of questions on this already. Go, some go for it. some on the, um, on the declaration. What's the best way to secure an updated valid declaration of all the amendments over the years? Well, I mean, if you're talking about just doing a restated declaration, that's something that you can do, in my opinion, as long as you're not changing the substantive text. The board can just vote in favor of compiling a restated declaration to take all the previous amendments and putting them into one place. We do that all the time. It takes a little bit of time to put everything together, but it's fairly, fairly simple. Um, okay. But again, if you're talking about amending the documents, making substantive changes, that's going to require a membership vote. So what proof does an owner need that they're doing an Airbnb? Because somebody's doing it, they're denying it. Their doc says no short-term rental, rentals, but it seems like it's pretty transient. Different people coming in and out. What proof do they need? Well, I mean, what proof does the association need to show that someone's violating? Yes. I mean, it's the same proof you're going to need for any other violation, for any other restriction in your documents. I mean, whether it's it's testimony of witnesses who see it or whether it's not having a proper uh, application on file if you have leasing approval authority and have a screening process. So it's sort of Airbnb, I wouldn't treat Airbnb violations different from having to prove up any other violation. I know Natalie's going to go into a pre presentation on covenant enforcement next, so maybe she'll hit on uh, some of those nuances. But you bring up a great point on Airbnb. What I did want to hit on that is Airbnb specifically I don't like to rely just on the minimum lease term in my declaration for a short-term rental violation. I, certainly you can make the argument that a, a, a minimum lease term of 90 days or, or 30 days or three months or whatever it is uh, acts to prevent transient tenancies like that. But if I'm doing an amendment and I, and I know I have a client that wants to address 
Airbnb and transient tenancy. I like to spell it out specifically in, in my language. I like to say no transient tenancy, such as but not limited to Airbnb, VRBO, and the like, uh, whether by lease, by license, by any other occupancy agreement. Spell it out specifically. That's my big advice on any of these restrictions is if you're trying to prohibit something, make it clear what you're doing. So vacation home exchange is a new thing um, where no money actually changes hands to be considered a rental. It's more like an Airbnb with you know, Bitcoin or, or something where it doesn't same, same premise, correct? Right. Right. And, and, and again, that's the whole point when you're trying to draft amendments is you want to try to close all these loopholes. So you know, I, there's people that have argued that Airbnb is not a rental, that it's a licensing or some other occupancy agreement. And therefore they don't have to comply with your leasing restrictions because they're not technically leasing. So again, if you're doing amendments, make sure to try to capture all these things, maybe even bring up specifically reference this type of home sharing exchange and, and, and make it a prohibition. So there's no question and no loophole. So what can, a, what can an owner do if they believe the board is not acting in their best interest? They're not um, going after these repeat offenders. They're not posting minutes. They're, um, what recourse do they have and, and what does an owner do? What's the first step if they felt like somebody was negligent on anything that the, uh, that the association should be doing, the board should be doing? Well, I mean, look, there's so many things you can do. If you're in the condominium, there might be ways to file complaints with the with the division that might have jurisdiction, depending on the topic. Uh, you can hire a lawyer and possibly sue the association. But the, the truth is, those types of things are only going to, and I hate to say it with a group of lawyers here, but it's only going to benefit the lawyers. I mean, your real recourse, if you're an owner and you don't like what your association is doing, you've got two recourses. You can recall the board if you can get a majority of the members of the community to agree with you. Or you can wait for the next election and campaign against those people and get new people in, in your election and your recall. That's your way to change your board and to, and to change policy. So there's a lot of owners that say, oh, well, those people are relatives. Those people are relatives. I mean, they can try to pull the, the wool over um, everyone's eyes as long as possible. What do we do about those people that people keep saying they're relatives, but they're still transient people that are coming in? What do you do about them? And then what about criminal background checks? Yeah. Um, do the buyers or the renters have to pay for that criminal background check? Well, on the on the relative issue again, you know, try to put something in your documents that says that guests that stay more than X number of days in a year, uh, whether family or not, will be deemed to be uh, tenants and therefore treated as tenants pursuant to the lease restrictions. You can again try to close those loopholes by putting some specific language in your documents to try to catch those things, but it's never going to be perfect. I mean, there's there's never a, a great answer to it. Again, I'm looking forward to Natalie's presentation on enforcement in general because I'm sure she's got some great thoughts on that too. In terms of the criminal background check, that's that's a great point. You can amend your documents to give you some some screening process, criminal background check. But there's a lot of concerns with that, and, and that's another point that I wanted to get into. There's a fair housing concern there, and it's and it's really come to light recently with some HUD guidance that came out this last summer. And if you're taking criminal background into account, you have to be very very careful because if the person that is applying for the rental is of a protected class, whether it be national origin, race, or otherwise you're subjecting yourself to potential scrutiny based on discrimination if you're turning that person down and you don't really have a true legitimate reasonable basis to do so. And what the HUD guidance, the most recent one says is you really need to be careful about making sure that we're not taking into account just arrest records, that it must be actual convictions, that it must be recent. We're not talking about somebody that's done their time 20 years ago for, for a felony. And we're also not talking about just all felonies. The recent HUD guidance really seem to limit it to very aggressive, violent felonies. So in drafting these types of screening processes for criminal background, my caution is you really want to hit just the most absolute, most egregious of crimes to deal with. Otherwise, you're really going to be under some serious scrutiny. One more, and this question keeps coming up, and I just need kind of a, a, a a quicker quick answer how does the board actually prove the owner is involved in airbnb it's he say or she say how do they actually prove it do they take pictures do they take pictures of different license plates that are coming in i mean how invasive does the investigation have to go to prove that these owners are actually involved in airbnb activity that they shouldn't be pictures and testimony are great obviously if you can find their uh, the the advertisement on the airbnb website with that address that's that seems to be game over so that would be helpful but again like any other enforcement you know the, the more evidence you can compile the more witness statements you can take that's really what you need to do you need to get a preponderance of the evidence to show that it's more likely than not that the person is violating the documents Stephen, i wish we had an hour to talk to you we don't it was very informative thank you very much uh Happy natalie we're very excited to see what you have to say
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to talk to you today about covenant enforcement. Uh, it is a very broad topic, like Stephen said, um, and it can encompass so many things within the association. I thought it best to focus today on how can the association set itself up for success when enforcing the governing documents and the covenants. Um, and to do so, I think we need to better understand some of the defenses that owners can raise to justify their violations of the covenants, such as the waiver defense or the selective enforcement defense. Um, waiver comes up a lot when associations are trying to enforce their governing documents. Courts have found that an association, if it's aware of a violation for a lengthy period of time, without raising any objections to it, it may have waived the right to enforce that violation later, since a reasonable inference can be made that the association's willing to tolerate that violation. So one of the takeaways that I always inform our associations of is to begin enforcement actions of a violation timely after learning of that violation in order to mitigate a successful waiver defense down the line. So if you know that someone is keeping a pet against the restrictions in their unit, or if you know that they've put up a screen enclosure in violation of your documents, don't wait two to three to four months or years before starting enforcement efforts. And an enforcement effort can be sending that violation letter or that warning letter to the owner, letting them know what it is that they're violating, giving them a time to cure that violation um, and a reasonable time to comply with that notice. Another defense that we see come up often is the defense of selective enforcement. And it's raised when an association tolerates a violation by one owner and then chooses to undertake enforcement action against another owner in connection with a substantially similar violation. This one uh, is a defense that in particular courts have found that if the owner can show that they were targeted for enforcement, and the association at the same time was tolerating this violation from another owner, that restriction will not be um, upheld against that particular owner. We see this a lot when an association has gone a, a length of time not enforcing certain provisions within their governing document. So associations may occasionally find that in particular, provisions in their governing documents, such as pet restrictions, um, have not been enforced for some time. The board realizes that those restrictions existed in the governing documents, and then they decide that they wanna go ahead and start enforcing those restrictions. But how can they do so and not run into problems with waiver and selective enforcement? And oftentimes we tell our associations that this can be achieved through effective communication with your community. The association can revive its governing documents um, if it first provides notice to the community of its intent to do so, hopefully gives them a reasonable time for those who might be violating those restrictions um, to cure those restrictions. And thereafter, it can start prospective enforcement of the governing documents. Now, I say this with a caveat, because I do recommend that you speak to your association's attorney when deciding um, if certain owners should be grandfathered in to some of the conduct that they were doing that may have violated the restrictions in the past, um, because there are certain situations where they should be grandfathered in to best protect the association from any waiver claims or possible selective enforcement claims down the line. but. If you do have these restrictions in your governing documents that perhaps have not been enforced uniformly or in some cases not at all, you can revive them. You just need to submit the proper notice to the community. And we often call this a republication letter. Sometimes it's referenced as a chattel shipping uh, letter. Um, but properly notifying the owners of the future enforcement does help put aside some of these arguments 
or appearance of unequal or selective enforcement down the line. And to recap, if the association wants to succeed in its government enforcement endeavors, um, two of my recommendations is to uniformly apply your restrictions against all owners and residents and to do it so timely, which I think is one of our biggest issues that I'm seeing on my end with some of my communities, that they're not timely acting on some of these violations, and it seems like they're waiving their right to do so. What is timely? Somebody asked, what is what is a timely time? How do you, how do you define that, quantify that? It's going to be defined mostly um, on a reasonable standard, but some of your governing documents might actually give you a timeline. I have some clients where their governing documents say that they have to act within 30 days of finding out of the violation. Uh, but usually we're gonna look at it reasonably. If somebody um, put up a screen enclosure that they shouldn't have, act as soon as you can to address those issues. Don't let time pass by. I've got an interesting violation here. There's a violation for $1,000 according to a Florida statute on deed restrictions. Um, is there a time frame that we can start the violation process again for the same violation? The reason is uh, a repetitive owner keeps boats on the property more than the allowed time, but the $1,000 fine is cheaper than boat storage. You see this in New York all the time where people are just parking and getting tickets because it's cheaper than parking. So what do we, what do they do in this situation where the owner is repeatedly parking his boat there for a $1,000 fine? He's just paying the $1,000 fine because it's cheaper than boat storage. He must live in, in Miami Beach. It, it might be time to, to, to kick this up a level. Um, yeah. Sometimes when the violation notices are not enough or money is not enough, you guys need to talk to your association's attorney and injunctions might be the way to go. Um, if somebody's violating the governing documents and they're not following through, uh, when you're providing them this opportunity to cure, uh, the next step is usually legal action. And depending on your governing documents, it might be an injunction through um, civil court. A lot of questions about pets. like. We have a lot of, can, I'm just going to rattle these off and I'm sure the answer is yes, all these can be done if it's in the, the, the docs. Can a uh, charge, can a fee be charged for pets? How much for a pet fee? How much for a late fee if they're not paying the ma ma maintenance fee? Um, can they restrict the size of dogs? Can they restrict the type of dogs? Uh, a lot of pet questions. And we get them all the time. Yes, you can. So long as you have the restrictions in your governing documents and not just in a rule. Um, like Stephen mentioned, oftentimes your governing documents may say you have a right to pets, um, and maybe that means that they can that the association may have a right to register that pet. But if you're going to be charging fees, if you're going to be restricting the type of pet, the weight of the pet, that should all be in your declarations, not just in a rule. It is election time. Candidates post signs which are taken down by board presidents as they don't comply with the rules for the three by five card. Um, I called them out, you know, to, to, to several and for surprise, surprise, these declarations apply towards any individuals that are running for for board. So the question is basically, what do people do if they want to run for the board, but they're kind of being um, blocked out? and boxed out by the uh, the current administration. So if we're specifically talking about the ability to advertise yourself, um, most governing documents, especially in condominiums, the statute itself allows you to provide an information sheet with your information so that you can advise the community of your qualifications as a candidate. Um, but if you are not being allowed to run, if that's the question, um, in violation of the governing documents that you're gonna have to seek the recourses that are under the statute or under the governing documents themselves. So basically anything can be done, any fees, any restrictions, but it has to be put into the documents. And like Steven said uh, before, that's gonna, that's gonna have to require a vote and a change. And yeah. that's not always easy. It isn't always easy. And with the caveat that not all fees uh, can happen. Um, for example, sometimes you have something called a transfer fee and there are limits to what type of fees associations can charge. Uh, but if you're looking to charge a reasonable fee, our recommendation is that you have that authority in your declaration. And if you don't have it, it is gonna require a member vote. So a violation letter has been sent out to the owners. The owner does not respond or correct the violation. What is their recourse now? 
you're going to have to talk to your association attorney, but it's going to likely require some legal action. Uh, if you're in a condominium, it might require um, you filing some sort of arbitration. Um, if your governing documents say that that's your next step. Um, if you are in um, a HOA, it might be going through to pre-suit mediation and trying to mitigate this before you go to a lawsuit. Um, so it is going to be dependent on what's going on. Um, what the type of violation is and what your governing documents say. But if the warning letters are not sufficient, you just have to kick it up a notch and go to the next step. I would, we could answer pet questions all day because there's tons of them here, but we've got to move on to the next. It was very informative. Thank you. And we're very excited to see what Scott Lee has to uh, offer us next. Thank you. Thanks, Rudy. So we're going to talk about collections. There's so much to cover in collections. I'm going to try and jam in as much as possible within this five minute time span. Generally speaking, my philosophy is to be aggressive in the dozens of communities that I represent, mostly in Palm Beach County, the aggressive collection approach and not doing something non-compliant with the statute, but following the statute and to, to the T typically generates the best collection results. And here are the four stages of collections, uh, which was actually modified to some degree about two years ago where there was an initial stage which was added, and that is called the notice of late assessment letter. Uh, that generally is, is sent by the property management company. Uh, the legislature in Tallahassee came up with the idea that let's carve out the attorneys from the beginning uh, aspect of the collection process and have the property management companies themselves send out the notice of late assessment letter, which will perhaps keep a lid to some degree on attorney's fees that are going to accrue on a delinquent account. So before the account can be turned over to the law firm, uh, typically it's your management company. If you're self-managed, then I guess someone within your self-managed community has to do this, although it's not advisable, uh, to send out this notice of late assessment letter that has to make reference to the outstanding assessments, late fees, and interest. The owner has 30 days from the, the date of that notice of late assessment letter to pay the delinquent balance. And it's paid, wonderful, and the account is current. If the owner does not pay the balance in accordance with the amount set forth in the notice of late assessment, then it's to be turned over to the attorney uh, to go through the next three stages, potentially, of the collection process, starting with something called the notice of intent to file a lien letter, uh, colloquially also known as a demand letter. And that's the attorney demand letter setting forth the unpaid assessments, late fees, interest, plus the attorney's fees as the total amount that not, must be remitted by the owner to the association in order to make, uh, to make the account current. So th the amount should be remitted to the association, but to the law firm directly. So the law firm could make note of it and communicate to the association that we've received collection and that would put a hold or a stop to the next stage. 45 days after the notice of intent to lien letter has gone out and if the account is still delinquent, and this now applies both in the world of condominium associations and HOAs, it used to be different a few years ago, it was 30 days in the world of condominium associations, but that was uh, adjusted to make it consistent with homeowner associations, where 45 days later after notice of intent to file lien slash the man letter is sent out and the account is still delinquent, the owner has not paid, then we move to the claim of lien stage. And this is the instrument that again makes reference to all the amounts that are outstanding, unpaid assessments, interest, late fees, attorney's fees. And that document gets recorded in the public records. It's a pretty big deal. Uh, and that shows publicly as a lien on the person's, uh, on the owner's real estate. It's critical that, and it's required statutorily for that claim of lien to only be done by an attorney. Uh, I've seen it in the past, unfortunately, where collection agencies were taken upon themselves to do these claims of lien, and that is the unauthorized practice of law. So whether you're using a collection agency or if you're self-managed and you're attempting to file liens on properties for unpaid assessments, that's problematic and it's actually technically a crime. So make sure your, your, uh, your law firm doing your association collections handles that. The big uh, decision thereafter comes if the account still is not paid and 45 days has gone by since the recorded claim and lien was sent out to the owner. That's when the association, the board of directors, in conjunction with uh, significant analysis and discussion with association council, decides to take the next serious step of filing a lien foreclosure lawsuit. 
And that is exactly what it is. It is a foreclosure lawsuit. Just like a bank can foreclose on a mortgage, we as an association can foreclose on that lien. And that means we can actually take that property, we being the association, uh, upon the conclusion of that lien foreclosure. Sometimes uh, when the litigation is concluded, uh, what occurs is there's a third party that bids at the lien foreclosure sale. So just like with at mortgage foreclosure sales, when and if a final judgment foreclosure is obtained, the property gets uh, put up for auction and there is a bidding process. Now, the association does not have to come up with money to bid at their own lien foreclosure sale. They have an automatic bid equal to the final judgment that they've obtained in the course of the litigation. However, if a third party interested in this property wants to swoop in and buy this property, they'll have to pay more than the final judgment amount. And if that, that takes place, that money is deposited with the clerk of court and the association will get a remittance for the amounts that they're owed pursuant to the final judgment, and the third party will end up being the owner of that property. However, the association has to plan on the possibility of owning this property at the end of the lien foreclosure process, because if there is not a third party that steps in and bids beyond the final judgment amount, the result will be that title to the property will uh, will be awarded to the association through something called a certificate of title issued by the clerk of court. And that is just as good as a deed and it's evidence of ownership. So this is a big deal. The association becomes the owner of the property. Maybe not a great idea for the association to go that route and become the record owner. What are the factors as part of that decision making? The condition of the home. Is there an existing mortgage on the property? The ability to rent out the property to third parties and recover some income. Uh, all those kind of business elements needs to be taken into consideration when uh, taking the plunge into a lien foreclosure lawsuit, which is more expensive, more costly, filing fees, court reporter fees, process server fees, and, and attorney's fees certainly go beyond just the filing of a lien or sending out a notice of intent to uh, uh, file a lien. Scott, so, how often do you see that happening that people are going after these properties like that? Uh, more often than not, because yeah. there are, there are uh, in today's real estate market, although it's started to come down a little bit, certainly, uh, you're seeing third party investors swoop in and and gobble up these properties and pay more than what the for, the final judgment is. And now that could still even be true if there's a mortgage on the property. So right. if there's a mortgage on the property, now a common question I hear is, well, if we as the association become the owner of the property and there's a mortgage on the property, are we gonna have to make those mortgage payments? And the answer is no. You know, the, the association is not uh, thereby uh, obligated to the payments under the loan. But it's a serious consideration because the association then cannot resell the property because you have a mortgage that's encumbering the property. Right. And in all likelihood, the mortgage amount, perhaps not in all cases, will exceed the value of the property, which will prohibit the association from selling it on the open market. However, in many cases, we see these mortgages as being stale not being enforced, there's no existing mortgage foreclosure, there's no known action by a bank to enforce their mortgage, yet there's still a recorded mortgage on the property. In that circumstance, it still may be a good business play for the association to foreclose, because then, even though it's a mortgage and they can't sell the property, they could rent it out and derive income from the rental of that property. Again, the association has to be set up to do that. They have to have the personnel, whether it's the right, property right, management right. company to assist, uh, they have to be comfortable that it's not going to cost $20,000 to do a mold remediation in order to make the property rentable. They have to understand what the rental market may uh, generate in terms of rental income. All those are important considerations as it relates to the decision to proceed with that lien foreclosure. But I've now, seen on delinquencies, now on delinquencies and special assessments, can they be financed by the owners in an aggregate loan through the association, or does it have to be a private loan from each owner on delinquencies on special assessments? You mean the association obtaining a loan or the, the owner getting a separate loan in order to finance their own assessment? Right. Finance um, by the owner in an aggregate loan through the association, or does it have to be a private loan? 
for those the, delinquents or special yeah, assessments. The association should never be in the business right. of lending money to uh, their owners for any purpose, whether it's right. you know to cover delinquencies or anything else. So yeah, at the end of the day, the association just wants to get paid the amounts due on the account from the delinquent owner. If they obtain a private mortgage, a private loan for that purpose, that's fine. It doesn't really matter from the association's perspective, but the association should never finance the assessments in any form or fashion to the delinquent owners. Now, can a, can a board of um, directors establish special assessments to level out the budget that is deficient due to the increase of insurance or the structural integrity reserve? Yes, absolutely. And that that's, that is one of uh, a, a common special assessment where there is an operating deficit uh, mid-year and insurance is a big thing these days, of course, with the spike of insurances. And if there's a budget shortfall, the mem the board of directors has every right to impose a special assessment to cover that budget shortfall provided, big however, uh, we have to look at the governing documents to make sure that the board of directors alone can make this special assessment, impose that special assessment on the membership. Sometimes, I'd say maybe 10, 15, 20% of the time, there'll be language embedded in the bylaws or the declaration indicating that the membership has to approve of any special assessment or certain types of special assessments. So those documents have to be reviewed first before the board of directors plows forward with seeking to impose a special assessment. Another uh, concern or factor in deciding whether or not to foreclose on, on a unit for a delinquency is the cleanness of the accounting behind the scenes, because ultimately there could be a trial uh, on this issue if the delinquent owner is contesting the foreclosure, saying, hey, I don't owe the amounts that are being claimed by the association. The association has to have a real strong ledger that indicates the amounts they're doing owing. And sometimes you'll see multiple management companies handling this account over time. And the these ledgers sometimes don't add up or the balances from one ledger to the next don't transfer well. That's an evidentiary concern that will first be borne out perhaps at the time of trial. So we have to have that strong ledger and accounting before we, pl you know, we plunge into that lien foreclosure case. I love it. I mean, I just find the, the condo law absolutely fascinating because no two condos and no documents um, are alike. So I'm sure it keeps everybody on this panel extremely busy. I could talk for hours with this. I really appreciate your insight. It was uh, it was great. And we're excited to see what uh, what Jeffrey Green um, has to say. Jeffrey, what do you got for us? Thanks, Rudy. Um, so I specialize in construction law, and it's uh, a big topic to cover in five minutes. So what I decided to talk about today is a very important and often misunderstood topic that is very um, topical right now with all of the recertification processes that we're going to be going through, which could be obviously hundreds of thousands, multiple million dollar projects. And in order to best protect the association for these types of projects and really any project that is over $100,000, I recommend the association take out performance and payment bonds. And oftentimes associations, board of directors don't really understand what performance or payment bonds are. They kind of confuse it with insurance and bonds are not insurance. They're not there to protect the association against damage to other property. That's really what general liability insurance is for, is if the contractor damages, not the work he's doing, but another component of the condominium, or God forbid, if he hurts someone outside of his scope of work while doing the work. That's general liability insurance. What, uh, what uh, bonds are specifically performance bonds are there to ensure that the contractor either completes his work if he abandons the project or the work is repaired if the contractor does it wrong or replaced if it needs to be replaced. So performance bonds to me are the most important bond that an association should take out as part of a project. They're typically 2% of the project costs. That cost is borne by the association and is well worth it. So when you do your budgets, always budget 2% for these bonds. Um, the, the flip side, not taking one of these bonds out could cost the associations hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars if a contractor goes out of business or abandons the project. So a performance bond, the first type of bond I'll talk about, as I said, it, it obligates the contractor or the surety in this case who issues the bond to complete the work if there's an issue with it. It's very important that the association or the board of directors follows the appropriate procedures 
for implicating the bond because as, as we all know, no one wants to pay. Sureties don't want to pay. They'll look for any excuse not to pay. So it's very important. As soon as the association board of directors discovers an issue with their prop with their project, is to notify the surety that you're considering declaring the contractor in default. At that point, the surety is then obligated to meet with you and see what they could do to try and get the project resolved. If they can't get the project resolved at that point. The board needs to formally terminate the contractor and then tell the surety that they want the surety to take over and also that the board is willing to pay the rest of the contract balance to the surety to finish the job. It's very important that the board does that and follows that proper procedure. Obviously, if you're in this situation, you'll need your attorney to help you out because you won't want to miss any sort of procedural requirement that then doesn't obligate the surety to pay. A couple of other things that are very important. Don't make a big change to your contract. Don't add a, another scope of work for a million dollars because you have a contractor there without either getting a new bond or modifying the existing bond because the surety is only obligated to the original scope of work, the contractor, and you agree to perform. So again, if you're going to make what's called a cardinal change to the bond, notify the surety. Another important thing to remember is don't overpay the contractor or don't perform repair work yourselves without notifying the surety because it's their obligation to do the repair work. If you come in there and hire someone else, they're not going to pay you for it. They're going to say they could have done it cheaper or they would have found a different way to do it. And one last consideration with performance bonds is the surety is limited to the penal sum of the bond, meaning the contract value. So if you sign a contract for a million dollars and the contractor absconds, the surety's limit is only up to that million dollars minus any payments you've made to the contractor. Important. And briefly, another very important bond that you'll hear about is payment bonds. These are absolutely necessary for any project to avoid the quote dreaded liens. I'm sure you've all heard of liens. Probably the worst thing you want on one of your properties or your condominium because then owners can't close. There's a pain, painful process of having to get partial releases of liens. So to avoid that, for any project, get a payment bond. That guarantees that subcontractors are going to be paid. Um, you still have the issue of the contractor. You have to pay the contractor or work out the contractor. He can file a lien, but for the subcontractors, materials, suppliers, you'll want a payment bond. There's two types, a conditional and an unconditional. Ideally, you'd want an unconditional. That just means no matter what, the payment bond has to pay for the subcontractors. But those are harder and harder to get in today's market. You're likely going to get what's called a conditional payment bond meaning the association still has to make proper payments to the contractor, get your releases once you make proper payments. And as long as you've made proper payments, you will then be protected uh, from a lien from subcontractors or suppliers. Where do you get performance bonds? Through any, your insurance agent should be able to help you get a performance bond. They're typically issued by the same companies that issue insurance, Travelers, Great American, those types of companies. So uh, you should ask your insurance agent uh, also, that when you're negotiating with the contractor, they typically will have the ability to get a bond, especially if they're a well-known contractor on a big project. So they'll be able to get the bond themselves. They have bond ratings for these contractors and contractors that don't have um, a good history will have a harder time getting these bonds. Um, contractors that have been all along around for a long time and have a better reputation, have a better bond rating. Um, so this is a, a good way to also kind of judge the uh, the grade of a contractor, true? That's a very good point, Rudy. And yes, if you're dealing with the contractor that can't get a bond, it should set off red flags. And maybe you should look around to see if there's a different uh, contractor. And I would make that a condition of the contract that they need to pull a bond. So if they can't, you're not in breach of contract. I think this is one of the most important segments here as the milestone in the SERS is going to create a true um, supply and demand situation and resources with labor and materials is going to be stretched thin. It's important that these associations protect themselves. I got a question here for you. So an association uh, voted to make a material alterations to an outdoor area. There were two large gardens uh, showed in the de declaration plats 
and an installation of a putting green and two outdoor kitchens. The design um, significantly changed the plant design. How long does the association have to amend those documents for the uh, the plat survey, if you will? That's an interesting question. I thought it was too, and that's why I wanted little, to throw it at you. Plat surveys typically aren't aren't amended by the association. Is this material alteration approved? Yep, seventy five percent vote. Okay, so assume first of all, you would need to get a permit and permission from the governmental authority to get this approved. So if you're going to do something that changes the plat and maybe is inconsistent with the use, you're not going to be able to get a permit. So if you get a permit and follow the permit procedure, you'll be okay with uh, with making this material alteration. Here's one where everyone's trying to kind of, uh, you know, push the blame different directions. If a management company allows for a substandard contract to be executed or awarded um, a project on a poor non-vetted contractor, is the management company liable for damages? Well, your management company is an agent of the board. They don't ultimately make the decisions. They make recommendations. They're their, your business advisor. So the board of directors should consult with their legal counsel to review the contract. They could, should consult with other professionals to properly vet contractors. And ultimately, if they sign someone that does a poor job, it, it's on the association, not your management company, unless there's some kind of fraud or unclean hands that's going on where the management company is getting kickbacks. But if it's just, you know, a poor contractor, that's not the management company's responsibility. How long do payments and performance bonds last? Is there a statute of limitation on claims? Can a association who finds major defects, irrigation system after the turnover, still go after the contractor of bond? Good question. For, for performance bonds, you have five years to make a claim on the bond. So if there's a, a latent defect that you find three years after the work, yes, you can still make a claim on the bond. Uh, with regard to the, the payment bond, you'll know within a year because that's the time frame someone has to file a lien against you. So you'll know what liens are out there at that point in time. So if an association goes through a turnover and does a 558 and it is settled and afterwards they still find something, can they go after that bond even after the 558 has been satisfied? Okay, so just to clarify, there wouldn't be a bond to the association for the 558 because they didn't construct the project. Right. Bond is when the association is entering into a contract, say for a recertification where they're doing stucco work or something like that. Um, so your claims for that point for the 558 and the turnover are against the developer, general contractor and the design professionals. So it's very important if you do enter into a settlement, know what you're releasing. Don't release what's called latent defects against any party unless you're being compensated for them because if you release latent defects everyone's done and you can't pursue them but if you don't release latent defects and specifically make a carve out in your release that you're preserving your claims against latent defects and you find something uh, within the statute of repose which is 10 years after turnover or other triggers you then can pursue the people who built your condominium is it advisable to ask a contractor to include the association to their policy to hold us harmless on a project amount of $85,000. Um, hold harmless is really big with these contracts recently. Right, I, I'm trying to, what are they asking to hold harmless? Um, the association. For their own negligence. I right. guess that's also part of, yes. Well, you wanna make sure the contractor has appropriate insurance. Uh, an appropriate amount of, of liability insurance and umbrella insurance, hopefully, depending upon the scope of the project, it will be millions of dollars worth of insurance. And you want to make sure the association is an additional insured on those insurance. That's a distinction. You don't just want the contractor to have insurance. You want to actually be part of that insurance policy right. so you can make a claim directly against the carrier. If that's the case, you should be okay um, with any... So the association support. sometimes want also... A, uh, a provision to hold harmless of anything. So if uh, somebody from the association walks by and puts their hand on a ladder while they're tying their shoe and the ladder falls over, um, you know, that is to, you know, hold them harmless of anything. Um, that's what the insurance is for. Correct. So I guess that's a deeper question 
to have um, that's a little bit more situational. I could talk construction law all, all day long, um, but I'm super curious. And thank you, Jeffrey Green. It was uh, sure. very informative. And if anybody has any questions on uh, construction defect, please reach, reach out to Jeffrey Green. Yeah. Jeffrey Rambaum, I am super excited to hear what he has to say because he always has something excellent for us. So uh, what do you have for us today, sir? Hi, everybody. Thank you for the uh, folks that are still out there and still listening. I'll try to not be too boring for the next five minutes, right? I have five minutes to tell you everything you need to know about Senate Bill SD4. For those of you that have taken the bet, the clock has not started yet, but you will owe me when I am done because we can cover the high points in five minutes. At least I feel like we can. And here we go. So milestone, we're going to talk about the milestone inspection, and we're going to talk about the structural integrity reserve study. Let's talk about the milestone first. Who does it apply to? Condos and cooperatives. And this is all very general right now. There are going to be some specific exceptions along the way. Maybe some of you will ask questions about it. But it applies to condominiums and cooperatives, buildings, three stories or higher, but not to single family, two family, three family buildings with three or fewer habitable stories. Try to say that five times fast. Now, when do you have to do it? Well, if your building is going to be 30 years after the date of the certificate of occupancy, or if you're within three miles of the coastline, then within 25 years, all right, of the certificate of occupancy. And if you're already there, you're already at the 30 year mark from the certificate of occupancy, meaning that your CO was issued on or before December 31st of, uh, what was it, 1992, then you have to be compliant with your milestone by 2024. There are two phases, phase one and phase two. Who prepares it? The Florida licensed architect or engineer. Phase one is visual of the report itself. But if you're dealing with these experts, it's very unlikely, I think, that they're going to not go into a phase two. Phase two provides for further testing and destructive testing as the expert may deem necessary. What do you do after you get the report? It must be provided to your local government. The association must post it in a conspicuous place. You must also post it to the website. If in fact you have a website, you need to send it, mail it, provide it to all of the owners at their official addresses. You have to maintain this report for 15 years. The failure to obtain the report, while not specifically in the legislation, is arguably a breach of fiduciary duty. We are talking about um, the milestone, which is a structural inspection. Local government, you have to cooperate with uh, local government as well. They may have different requirements, and we'll talk about this after my five minutes are up because I saw some questions on that. But remember, the architect or engineer who does the report gives it to local government. When do you have to make the repairs? Generally speaking, within 365 days of receiving your milestone report. Maybe sooner, of course, if in fact uh, repairs are imminent based on the expert's report. Uh, if he says you have to do this tomorrow, then you have to do that tomorrow. Structural Integrity Reserve Study, as we affectionately refer to it as the Sears. Who does it apply to? Generally speaking, once again, condominium cooperative buildings, three stories or higher. When do you have to have your structural integrity reserve study by December 31st, 2024? How am I doing on time, Mr. Moderator, Rudy? How are we doing? Two, two minutes. Okay, at least every 10 years after that, you must continually do it every 10 years. That's your update process. Um, who completes it? Any person qualified, but the structural integrity portion of the reserve study must be completed by a Florida licensed engineer or architect. The report must contain the list of the areas inspected, the estimated useful life, the estimated uh, repair cost and deferred maintenance, et cetera, plus the recommended annual amount to be set aside in the reserve. Yes, you can take into account any uh, changes in the estimates and expectation of life of the component because you have made repairs and things like that. If you fail to conduct it in the legislation, this is a statutory breach of fiduciary duty. Board members, don't let that happen to you. Waiving and reducing. You cannot waive or reduce these reserves after December 31st, 2024. No longer can you waive or reduce reserves. These will be mandatory. Timing. You must have your report completed, remember, by December 31st, 2024. And if you really play with the timing and you think this through a little bit, if you adopt your 2025 budget in 2024, but you did it in October, and then you receive your structural integrity reserve study in December, 
more likely than not, the first year the structural integrity reserve study components would be funded might actually work out to 2026. Just depends how you want to play with the dates in the legislation itself and if you're risk tolerant or not, because the division of condominium may have a different feeling about that. But a plain meaning of the statute lets you get there. Okay, did I do it in five? You did. 10 seconds to spare so we can get right into questions. Well Thank done. You. All right. A new record. So Angela is looking for a list of um, individuals that can perform the surge. It's going to be any engineering firm that has a architect or an engineer on staff. How to about M2E? The, the surge. Yes. Please call me. Um, but they also finished a 50 year inspection. Or, or, or and do they still have to do their milestone? There it comes. When when you have local government inspection requirements and state requirements, think of them separately. You might get a bang for your buck because you're going to talk to your engineer about doing the report and covering both aspects, or maybe timing wise, even you have to complete the milestone as well within 180 days once you get notice from local government. But what if you just did it yesterday and now you get the notice from local government? What then? So these are interesting questions. They are somewhat glitch oriented, but you have to comply with both. I would suspect you would go back to the engineer and say, please update this report. It would be very simple to do at that point and should be very de minimis in terms of cost. So in Boca Raton, somebody asked, how do the bulk overtown requirements, are they parallel to the state requirements? Funny you should ask. Glad I saw that question in advance. The, I just, when we were scrolling the questions, um, actually Boca is very similar. It's very easy, by the way. You can go to Google, you just type in Boca Raton building certification requirements and you'll pull the act right up from their ordinances. And it is very similar to the state requirements, but to work through the backlog, at least Boca Raton had the foresight, unlike the, uh, respectfully, unlike the Florida legislature to realize the impact this is going to have on the engineers and architects, and they have addressed in section C the backlog schedule in terms of how to get all of these buildings that need these inspections uh, completed, how to get them done in a timely fashion. So they've actually addressed that issue. You'll also have to pay the municipalities a few dollars as well that have these separate requirements. A Boca Raton's fee is $500. But generally speaking, it uh, comes very, very close to the state's requirements. Uh, I don't hear you, Rudy. For some, Rudy, you have uh, muted your microphone. Yep. So this is for three stories. Are any recommendations for two stories? Does it mean two stories should not also? I take... want to direct anybody with that question to talk to that association's lawyer. That is a very specific question. There is a minor glitch dealing with the two-story buildings. It, the division has one interpretation. I don't necessarily share that interpretation. So what needs to happen is the lawyer needs to explain the division of condominiums interpretation. Then uh, share with them the plain meaning, if you will, of the legislation and discuss with the association. You know, you could go down the either of these two tracks, but if the division doesn't agree, then there could be repercussion and you may end up in circuit civil court proving the point that the division was wrong uh, in terms of one of their interpretations. Usually they're very good, but I, they have uh, basically said that if your building is less than three stories, the items and what we refer to as little g, which by the way, I glossed over. So for my last 10 seconds, Rudy, the items in the structural integrity reserve study were the roof load bearing walls, floor foundation, fireproofing, fire protection systems, plumbing, electrical systems, waterproofing, exterior painting windows, any other item with your deferred maintenance that exceeds $10,000. Now, a lot of people ask, what about the foundation, right? How do you reserve for the foundation replacement? Everybody is jumping to the word replacement, thinking that everything has to get replaced. It doesn't. It has to be repaired. It has to be shored up, if you will. So I think from the engineering perspective, you're going to be looking at the foundation, not in terms of cost of replacement, but in terms of cost of repair. And it's going to differ for a three-story building than it will a 50-story tower. You know, in that 50-story tower, you're going to have some issues and some money needs to be set aside for that foundation. And it may be quite different depending on the type of foundation you have in that three-story building. But, but Jeffrey, all this is going to change when the glitch bill comes out, none of this is going to matter. Everything's going to be really. Different. So have you heard about the glitch bill coming out? Because all my sources so far are telling me, no, at least the proponents of the Senate bill to begin with, um, 
nobody has the appetite for a glitch bill this year. Notwithstanding, I've published on it. I know some of my uh, peers have published on the glitches as well. And we're trying to um, get some action in Tallahassee and get some interest so we get some of these issues resolved. I don't think we're going to see any substantive changes this year in this year's uh, legislation when they meet again. What is it this year? It's coming up early or late this year, January or March. They rotate every other year. Uh, I believe, it, I believe it's start. March, but I'm I no lawyer. Um, I think January was last year. So it's going to be later in time before we even get anything out of the legislature. Um, but hopefully we'll get some uh, answers in terms of some of these glitches that are out there. Again, another topic we could talk to for hours. Um, there are more questions in there about this, but we're going to kind of open it up to the 45 minute uh, lightning section. So everybody get out their keyboards and start pounding Q&A. I would ask all the panelists, especially on the legal side, if you want to open up the Q&A and read a few, and if you just want to type your answer in those, we'll have access to all these questions and answers. And we can share those with everybody. Is that correct, Layla? If they're in the Q&A? Yes, we can. Okay, so if somebody um, other than me, if somebody on the panelists wants to start scrolling through these and just answering these, we'll provide these in a follow-up. Um, all these questions and these uh, and these answers, but let me get to a few here, and I'll just kind of pick somebody on uh, uh, random. Here's one for um, for uh, Jeffrey Rambaum. What's considered three stories? Well, if I live in a, a condo and I have thirty foot ceilings, it's one thirty foot story, or welcome, is that technically three well, stories? Welcome to the need for a glitch bill. What is a coastline? Why we're at it as well. Uh, these are questions that do not have definitive answers in the law. We can look at the building codes. We can generally say a floor would be 12 feet if we want to go to the building codes and look at it that way. What if the underground garage is only 10 feet? Does that count? Great questions. And it's going to take some creative thinking uh, to get clarity and to get answers on those questions. So I'm going to take this one. What should be done first, the structural integrity reserve or the milestone? Um, a competent engineer should do both at the same time because the inspection of the building, there's going to be overlap. So you'll get a cost savings benefit um, by selecting one engineer to, or architect to do that at the same time. Um, now, what are the requirements to fully fund reserves um, by December 24th, 2024, apply to all condos and co-ops? Yes. Um, three stories. But let's, let's talk about the term, Rudy, fully funded. Yep. yep. And, and what it means, because there's such a um, misunderstanding. It doesn't mean that if the HVAC uh, system, the primary system, is on the roof and it's a 50 story tower and it is a $2 million replacement item, do we have to have all $2 million? Does that mean fully funded? No, that's not what fully funded means. Let's hypothetically say that it is the, let's make it a million dollars so that the math will be a little bit easier for everybody. And we're in year five. Well, if it's a million dollar component, we know that we have to have, and we're in year one, we know that we have to put away $100,000 per year. Now, structural integrity, uh, let's say it is instead of the HVAC system, Oh, what's a good one, Rudy, to come up with? Uh, generator. We'll generator. Nah, I want to go with the roof. I want to go structural on this one. So uh, we need a million dollars for the roof, and we've never put away a dime for it. And Rudy's company comes out, and they do their report, and they say, you got five years left, and it's a million-dollar expense. Well, you can expect to see $200,000 a year for that reserve item for the next five years so that you're at a million. The term fully funded means for that year's budget, you have reserved the correct amount. It doesn't mean that you have the full amount already in the bank for that reserve item. It means you have putting away the right amount that year. At least in Florida, that's how we use the term fully funding, fully funded. Yep. So Natalie, here's a question. So can somebody do an assessment? Can the board um, approve an assessment just to fill those reserves? I'm so sorry. Um, so the question is, can the association pass an assessment just to uh, fully fund the reserves or Correct. be on track by the, uh, yes, uh, you can also amend your budget, follow the procedures to amend your budget and get it done that way. Um, I know that a lot of associations do it. You're going to pass a special assessment, like it's been mentioned before, be cognizant and ensure that it can be done so with uh, just a board approval and that you don't have any other uh, requirements in your declaration well, for well, and I, I want to add to that, that uh, really, I want to add to what Natalie yeah. said, because if there are restrictions in the governing documents, the lawyers on this panel know 
that there is a line of cases the lawyer can rely on. So if the expert comes in and says, this must be done, and you try to do the cash call, you try to take the vote of the membership, and they're dumb enough to vote it down, and then the board does an end run around the requirement of the membership vote, can they do it? The answer is yes, but they can't just do it on their own. They need an opinion from someone like Rudy's company that this component is a uh, safety requirement, basically. Uh, it comes down to life, uh, the police powers, constitutional police powers, uh, life, safety, welfare, that kind of thing, and that it must be done. Then the lawyer can write a very lengthy opinion relying on a whole series of cases as to why the board has the power. Now the board is acting under advice of counsel and they can levy that special assessment. But board members, you cannot do this on your own just because you heard it on this webinar. You must consult with legal counsel, period. So follow-up question, and, and I'll give this one to, to uh, Stephen Rappaport, but the docs say that our monthly dues can only increase 3% a year. And now with the structural integrity reserve, that's going to be over 3%. So what are you following? Are you following the state requirements or are you following the condo docs? Well, again, going back to Jeff's point, if you get, if you consult with legal counsel and you get that opinion from your engineer that it's an absolute necessity, then I think you can get that opinion letter that you can rely on to basically ignore that provision of the documents and do what you need to do. But if you're talking about a provision that says that the monthly assessments can only be increased by 3% and it doesn't affect your special assessment authority, then maybe to Natalie's point, you might have some authority if you don't need a membership vote for special assessments to do a runaround and do it by special assessment. Or maybe there's a way to build it in through a loan somehow. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's going to be funding options. And again, if it becomes something that's absolutely necessary, I, I try not to look at the document provisions as, as something that's going to tie my hands. Your ultimate obligation is to, is to get stuff done to make sure the place is taken care of. That is your ultimate goal. So there, there will be ways to work around it. Talking about getting stuff done, Scott, I've got, there's a small condo association where all the owners agree to email correspondence from the association. Is it necessary still to post... Um, minute notices and meeting notices on the property if everything is being handled via email? Notices for meetings are, are governed by statute and uh, notices for traditional board of directors meetings have to be posted in a conspicuous location. That's an obligation, whether it's on a bulletin board or at the guardhouse somewhere. Uh, so even if it's uh, disseminated via email, that will not suffice unless uh, there is a written consent form to receive notices electronically for a particular member. But for general board of directors meetings, it's always it's required practice to post in a conspicuous location. For special notices that require 14 days, whether it's the imposition of a special assessment or the adoption of an amendment, that uh, has to be mailed again, unless there is this written consent form on file from a particular member saying, please send me all notices electronically to the following address. So when it comes to votings, um, there was a really good question here about proxy. Let me find it. And it relates, as it relates to meeting minutes, uh, those are official records of the association. Those don't have to be posted anywhere. But if a member is making a request for a copy of meeting minutes and it's properly done, uh, and it can't be actually done by saying, I want a copy of, they have to have, they have to say and use the magic words, we would like to inspect the following documents and be specific as it relates to those records, which do constitute a business record in accordance with the statute, whether it's 720 or 718, then the association has an obligation to make those meeting minutes available for inspection uh, within 10 business days of receiving a proper written request. And a request is not an email. Uh, this is oftentimes uh, done incorrectly by owners. They shoot an email to the property manager or to a board member saying, we would like to inspect, we want copies of the following things. An email is not sufficient. It has to be either hand delivered or sent in writing. And if that's done with the key magic words, we'd like to inspect, then that triggers the 10 business day obligation of the association to make those documents available for inspection. So um, we have an individual, and I'll stick with you, Scott, on this one. Our HOA told us that proxy is a courtesy, not a right. They're requiring all owners to attend the meetings to vote. They just find this odd. Is this true? There, there's no mandatory obligation on the part of the association uh, to provide a limited proxy. Is it a, a good idea? Yes. You want to make it easy for folks to vote. You want to make it easy for there to be a quorum. So 
uh, the governance of the association can occur. But it's I would caveat necessary. that, Scott. I saw one surprisingly, and, and only really once, I think, in about 20 years, but I did see it once in the GovDoc. Unless so. it's in the, in yeah, in the bylaws. Yeah, they actually had that requirement, which was a little yeah. odd. So, right. But uh, very so, that's always uh, That's always the fallback, right. you know, where I should always say everything with take it with a grain of salt, depending upon how the bylaws or the declaration reads. If someone's voted by proxy, I understand that they have to sign the proxy form, but do they have to sign the ballot if they're voting? Well, ballots are a whole different ballgame uh, in terms of condominium associations versus HOAs. You know, first of all, the ballots are supposed to be anonymous in terms of who is voting for who. In, a, in the world of HOAs, oftentimes you see the voting occur through a limited proxy voting form. However, the way I craft these is I have it perforated, essentially, where the information related to the voter in an HOA is up top. And then when those come in and that's verified, then I cut off the bottom portion of the limited proxy and take that that voting activity that's embedded in the limit proxy and put that in a separate pile. So no one could you know, identify who voted for whom. For condominium associations, uh, it's the double envelope system, which is wholly different where you have an outer envelope and the smaller envelope enclosed therein. And that's not supposed to be signed anywhere on the ballot as to who voted for whom, although there's uh, arbitration division uh, decisions of the division of condominium saying if a ballot is inadvertently signed by an owner, it doesn't invalidate the vote, uh, but you're not certainly not supposed to put a line there for people to sign. So Natalie, I'll give this one to you. So what happens when a board of um, directors establish and collect an assessment for a specific need? And part of that assessment is used to pay bills from the operating budget because there was supposedly not enough money to cover the monthly ob obligations. Well, it definitely shouldn't be used for any purpose other than what that special assessment purpose was, unless you're following the procedures to, to change that. Um, if it was at the end of the special assessment purpose and there was some leftover funds, it's a little different. Um, but if that's happening in a community, you're going to want to consult um, with an attorney to see what the next step should be to ensure that that special assessment fund is being used for those special assessment purposes if the proper votes weren't taken to convert it to something else. Thank you. So I'll give this one to Jeffrey Green. Uh, it might not be in your kind of your wheelhouse, but so there's a condo and there's a co-op actually, it's a co-op. They have over 500 condos. Uh, these condos are spread over 12 buildings. Some owners have um, been have defaulted their payments of their monthly fees for several months. And, and can you evict those owners? And if the file is handed over to the law group, how long on average does it take to achieve this result of evicting owners? That's a good question, because co-ops are a little bit different than your right. other uh, community associations. But Chapter 719, which does govern cooperatives, has a procedure for uh, filing a claim of lien, and it, it wouldn't be evicting. Um, it, it would be foreclosing. I know it's a little different because it's a proprietary interest, but it would follow the same procedure as Chapter 718. So yes, you can foreclose on them. Uh, there may be an alternative in the dec in the declaration as well that provides how you could terminate their proprietary lease, but the statute hasn't spelled out. And how long it takes is dependent on whether or not they're going to defend it. Uh, if it's a simple matter, it could take six weeks to go through the court uh, process. If it's a default, if they hire an attorney and, and come up with some crazy defenses, we all know it could take six months or a year, depending upon how backlogged the court system is and what kind of defenses they are. And I want to so jump what in happens there. When... Hold on one second, Rudy. I need to jump yeah. in there just a second. Because you can, there's actually two tracks a uh, cooperative can take when someone is delinquent in the assessments. And I've seen attorneys use both successfully. To Jeff Green's point, one of them is sort of the very typical style of the uh, lien and foreclosure process, and somehow it makes its way through the court. Another way to do it is you terminate the proprietary lease, and that's where the eviction comes from or ejectment, because now you have somebody there unlawfully because that proprietary lease has been lawfully terminated. So there are two different tracks and different lawyers use the different tracks. I just wanted to point that out for the uh, person that asked the question. So, Stephen, I'll give this one to you. So uh, they're trying to curb unit owners who rent their units, but do not follow all the 
proper filings and payment regulations. Before approving their unit rental, can an association require, number one, a copy of the business tax receipt from the local government? Number two, proof of registration with the Florida um, Sales Tax Department? And number three, proof of registration with Pinellas County Tourist Development Tax Department? There's a lot of um, regulations that local municipalities have been put in place for these Airbnbs. Um, can the association we require that those are done? And if those aren't done, do they have legal action to evict people that are staying on short-term um, leases? Yeah. I think it's really all going to be dependent on the, exactly how the documents are phrased. I mean, like almost every enforcement issue, it's going to come down to the wording in your declaration. Does the declaration make that a condition to approving a rental? Does the declaration have language that rentals must comply with all applicable taxes and so forth? So the answer, the answer is a definitive maybe, and it, and it all comes down to what's in your documents. Um, I would, if you would, let, would like, I, I do want to, this one jumps out at me. There's a question about the, can the board institute a fee for comfort animals? That jumps out at me only because I've had some experience with the, with serving on the Palm Beach uh, County Fair Housing Board for several years. And this kind of speaks to me and it's, it's, it's an important one. And the answer is an absolute no. So there's very few things that are absolute, but you cannot institute a fee for a comfort animal because you cannot charge for an accommodation. But I wanted to, to answer this because it, it illustrates the ridiculousness, in my opinion, of the fair housing laws. If you're in a, in a association that allows the, the association to charge a pet security deposit on just a regular old pet, you still can't charge that same deposit that you could charge that regular pet on the accommodation, even though it's it's a, even though all it does is provide comfort. So um, th this is where the law is going in these types of areas. But I saw that question; it popped out at me, and I just wanted to jump on that because it's a it's a big distinction. I got one for Scott. Can we borrow from the reserves to balance a low balance in the operation account? So can you borrow from certain reserves to true up your operations account if your operations account is low? Uh, currently, currently, before we get to December 31, 2024, the answer is yes, provided there is a membership vote uh, for that purpose. So you would need to have a membership meeting uh, whereby uh, you would have to have a quorum of the membership and 51% of the persons uh, present and by person or by proxy have to vote in favor of taking money out of the reserves uh, for this non-reserve purpose, but that's going to change come December 31, 2024, unless there's some glitch bill that comes into play before then. I got one for Layla. Would you recommend and how would you recommend sending a webinar or recording out to unit owners so they more be they may be more informed? What we do is post it on YouTube and you can either have that as public or private or something called unlisted, which is when only the people with the specific link can view that webinar. And Excellent. if you have communication software, that would also help you. Jeffrey Green, so what can a what can unit owners do if the board has not been keeping up with necessary but expensive work, such as painting, such as concrete restoration, even though they're not forced to do so by the milestone inspection or by 40 year recertification, what are the rights that the unit owners can do if they feel that their building is being neglected? That's a good question. You, unit owners don't have a, a, a ton of rights as the decisions are made by the board of directors. I think another panelist said, if you're unhappy with your board, you have to campaign against them or try and recall them. Um, these unit owners really can't even reach out to legal counsel because we, you know, we're the attorneys, we represent the association, not the individual owners. If it does get to a point where it's a life safety issue as opposed to just the pain is peeling or, or you don't like the way something looks, then those unit owners should consult legal counsel who could then file some kind of either a derivative action or, or seek some kind of action to compel the association to make the uh, the proper maintenance uh, that typically would have to be some sort of life safety issue to reach to that level where a court would entertain that though. So a condo was built over 40 years ago and I'll stick with you Jeffrey Green a uh, condo was built over 40 years ago with rails 36 inches in height, can they be grandfathered in or do they have to be changed. Well, that's really a question for you as an engineer when when someone goes to redo a, a, a project. If you want to replace those railings, it's likely you'll have to replace them to today's code. If they're not up for replacement, 
and they're grandfathered in and they can be repaired, it's likely that they could be kept until they need to be replaced. But typically, once they need to be replaced, you'll consult, consult with your engineer who will look at that town's building code and they'll be able to give you a better answer than, than me as an attorney. But typically, replacement would require being consistent with the current code. Correct. Thank you. So let's go back to um, Natalie. Um, if a property does not allow Airbnb and the verbiage is clear on the docs and the rules, can the management deactivate an Airbnb guest access device? So can the association deactivate somebody's ability to get to and from a unit? Correct. I would say the answer to that would be no. Um, right. There are ways to stop this Airbnb rental from happening. I do not recommend that that be your um, enforcement mechanism would be you restricting their access to the unit. That's actually something that the statute does not allow us to do. Um, so if you're, a, if they don't, if they're not supposed to be there, um, then that's great. You guys have great defenses when it comes to your injunction um cases to get that tenant out of there and punish the owner for having violated your documents i wouldn't take the action of restricting access to the actual unit though jeffrey what rambaum the they have a... excuse Go me ahead. what about the amenities for the amenities that's something that you can do you're going to have to give some proper notice um, and hold some proper hearings but yes that you're going to be able to stop them from going to your pool if you're a higher end association from using the spa as well uh, but access to the actual unit i would not recommend you do you'd be in violation of the statute you could turn off the fast pass lane i suppose make them go through the guest lane every time Oof, that's brutal don't go there you're going to give me nightmares someone who has to drive to coral gables from broward um, a few times a week. Um, I got a question for Lisa. So there's a lot of expenses that these condos um, now have to deal with. And how has the banking and the loan situation changed recently? Well, it has changed dramatically since the Surfside condo collapse. And in, in terms of the financing itself, um, most banks maybe have a minimum loan amount of 100000 but now we're asking specific questions. Um, one of the most important ones that we recently added was, does your association require a vote to obtain a loan? And some of them will just say, well, no, it doesn't. I'm like, are you sure? Because, you know, make sure that you've consulted with your attorney if you've never had a loan. So that's one thing. But the biggest thing right now is, Banks are wanting to see reserve studies. We're wanting to see that they've that that these communities are planning for future expenses. And with the timeline ticking down to 1231-2024 with the fully funding of reserves, I'm seeing a lot of communities that have been waiving reserves for years. And then if they need the money, they just special assess. And I said, you're not going to be able to do that starting in, you know, January of 2025. And they're like, well, we'll just stroke a check. I'm like, no, you need to make sure that you're adhering to these condo safety law. And then a lot of them, and here's what's happening now, all the, you know, all the, we're in season, right? So we have all these, um, we'll say just snowbird board members that are now here. And they're like, what do you mean? What's this condo safety law? What's this all about? So I'm glad that there's a lot of, you know, attendees on this webinar, because this is all very important education. And we're only in January of 2023, December 31st of 2024 seems like it's very, very far off, but it's really not. And so I've said to some of these communities, start doing gradual funding of your reserves. So then by the end of 2024, you will be sufficiently funded. So a uh, line of credit. Is okay. an association charge interest on a line of credit if they haven't accessed those funds from the line of credit? Depends what type of line of credit. You have two different lines of credit. You have what's referred to as a construction line of credit, maybe a one or two year period, and that terms out. So let's say you're doing a project and during the construction, you're just paying interest only. Then we also have what's called an emergency line of credit. Now that cannot be used to you know, supplement a shortfall in your operating, but let's say, for instance, we had um, 
two hurricanes, right? We had Hurricane Ian and we had Hurricane Nicole. That is what an emergency line of credit can be used for. Prime example is even if you just had, let's say, $20,000 worth of landscaping damage, you would be able to draw from that line of credit and get that damage you know, repaired right away. Think about if you didn't have the emergency line of credit and here you had all these owners that maybe had to evacuate and now you're having to reach out to these owners and try to get the payment. So an emergency line of credit is also another consideration. So Jeffrey Rombaum, can you please get out your crystal ball? Um, do you envision the legislation eliminating or waiving the reserve provision for the condos? You mean mandatory reserves and no waiving? Yes. Not this year. What may happen next year? I don't know. I'm already hearing reports of individuals having to sell their units because the boards are taking proactive steps and they're trying to shore up their account so that it's all not going to come due at once, which is smart fiscal planning on their part. But I've already heard from people and a few friends included, I can't afford this anymore. I have to sell and move. I don't know where they're going to go, but I know that they can't, you know, they're saying they can't afford it. I think if we see enough action in the, uh, the constituency, the legislature is going to be forced to do something. Um, but uh, I would not keep my fingers crossed for this legislative session. Lisa, you don't have an, uh, an infinity amount of money to loan out and an infinity amount of loans to process. Is it safe to say that access to money is going to be a resource that is also going to be strained just like labor and just like materials when it comes to these concrete restorations or uh, some of these other um, elements that are going to need funds? Most definitely, because like like we were saying, it's all these communities now and banks only have so much money that they can lend out, right? And so even if they're getting an emergency line of credit, a lot of communities say, well, I hope never have to use it. So I got a $1 million emergency line of credit. I hope I never have to use it. But we as a bank, we have to set aside that money in case they do need to use it. So when we're looking at giving out that type of financing, it's not that we don't want to give it out. It's just sometimes we have to be very careful because with our underwriting team in the back of their mind is if someone does borrow from this loan, how is the bank being repaid and making sure that we get repaid on the loan? Is there different types of loans given to condos or co-ops or is it the same type of loan? Well, there's, there's, I mean, they're really the same types of loans, but the credit criteria, we look at different credit metrics. So especially when it comes to depending on what the projects are that are being, that the owners are undertaking, because you may have some communities where they say they may need a million dollars, but then they find out from their owners, you know, maybe they use Vinium software and they find out from their owners that basically a lot of the owners want to prepay their portion of the project costs up front and not participate in the loan. Got one for Natalie. And then I want to go to Beth Garcia because I know that her industry has changed quite a bit. But first to Natalie, can a revised and newly adopted version of HOA declaration have a retroactive effect on the previous declaration? Can a management company use newly adopted version of the declaration to penalize a homeowner um, for something that they've done previously on the previous declaration? Um, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, if you haven't enforced some sort of rule before and you're looking to enforce it now, my recommendation would be that that be perspective so that you are not encountering waiver issues or selective enforcement issues. So taking pet restrictions, if you have uh, pet restrictions that were in your declaration, they may be in your now amended and restated declaration, and you have never enforced them, you're looking to enforce them moving forward, I wouldn't penalize those who relied on your non-enforcement previously and now have pets, I would um, make sure that you are enforcing those prospectively. And if you're trying to maybe remove some of those pets from some of those homes, talk to your attorney. Um, they're probably gonna tell you that those individuals are grandfathered in and you can't now have them sell their dogs or relocate uh, their dogs in those cases. So Beth, um... A building needs to do a concrete restoration because they went through a milestone inspection phase one and they found deterioration that needs to be um, corrected 
So they need to go into a phase two, which is a mild or major concrete restoration. Um, well, can they claim that on their insurance? Yeah, it has to be a covered peril maintenance. That's just like anything else is not covered by insurance. Um, right. If it was damage was resulted as um, a result of a hurricane or flooding or something like that, then that's a different conversation. And that depends on exclusions and limitations on the policy because they're all different. There's no cookie cutter property policy. So you're insuring buildings, but you need to ensure that these buildings are taking care of themselves. And with this new legislation, um, how has the process changed to make sure that you guys, um, that these buildings are compliant? What type of new type of um, requirements are you guys requiring for, uh, for insurance? Yeah, so they're asking for the 40-year uh, certifications. They're asking for the reserve studies. Um, it was already mentioned the increase in the cost of construction in those reserve studies. You know, I just had a renewal that had a 60% 60, 60 increase. 40% of it was due to the increase in values to, because of the new appraisal and reserve study that was done. Um, so we're looking at the loss runs. We're looking at what needs to be done. Uh, if structural, if there's some uh, reports that are done and they're taking care of it prior to the renewal, we're communicating all of that with the carriers because it makes a difference. Um, as we know that there are less carriers now than there were eight years ago. Um, their limits are maxing out very quickly due to reinsurance capabilities. The, the market is just not there. So in order to give them a class A, the best uh, type of um, association to come to them, we have to give them all of the information that what the association is doing to make themselves better, to make them more desirable in the eye of the carrier. Excellent. Um, Lisa, somebody wants to know how they can find a loan or a credit line for their condominium. Well, you can call Lisa. She's a banker and she would be more than happy to help you. And I uh, recommend her quite a bit. So um, please look for her contact information in the follow-up email. Um, are there any kind of, yep, yeah, go ahead, Peggy. I'm sorry, I wanted to ask something of uh, Beth Rappaport from Campbell. And I wanted to know, what are you doing to assist your associations with these building uh, issues uh, from a proactive uh, uh, standpoint? A lot of what needs to happen is um, pertains to planning. You know, failure to plan is planning to fail. And so a lot of times now we're walking into a situation where there's been no planning for quite a number of years. So we have to do some catch up planning and then we have to also try to at the same time incorporate uh, what needs to be done for the community to ensure the best future possible. So your managers are actually bringing this to the forefront of their agendas? Yes, absolutely. This is something that we're really pushing on um, being proactive and even our owners get involved. And uh, we sit down and we strategize as to what needs to be done, the timeline, whether, uh, you know, how it should be funded, how to structure the funding, and all those types of details. And I guess the only last thing is, and maybe this is not reasonable, but are your managers being schooled in any way for that preparation? Education is super important at Campbell. We do lots and lots of free education for not only um, our managers, but also for board members. Uh, you don't even have to be a customer. You can attend all of our webinars and we have blog posts and we have all kinds of information. We work with most of the people here in today's event um, because we really feel that educated board members and property managers are successful board managers and property managers. Thank you. Thanks, Peg. And, and more than ever, Beth Rappaport. Rudy, real, real, Rudy, if you don't yep. mind, I'll say something real quick. Yes, uh, please. Since we're talking about insurance and upcoming projects as involving concrete restoration or underwriting involving obtaining a loan, all this ties back to my very important topic of collection of assessments, because uh, what do bankers look at in the underwriting process? They look at your level of collections. And if you have not a wonderful percentage of collections, you're not going to receive a loan. If you're not collecting assessments properly, 
you're not going to have proper funding to be able to do these post uh, December 31, 2024 projects, and you may not be able to afford insurance. So the aggressive collection techniques and practices, inc which include a couple other things I didn't get to, such as tenant rent demand letters, you could demand rent to be uh, the rent to be provided to the association if the owner, the landlord is not paying assessments. And you could also recover money through the mortgage foreclosure sale surplus procedure, which is a great way uh, to collect assessments as involving a delinquent account that was a subject of a mortgage foreclosure. And same thing with a property tax deed sale, where there could be surplus proceeds as it relates to a property tax sale. And as a, a primary lien holder in that process, we've recovered, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for associations in those two processes, mortgage foreclosure sales and property tax sales. Scott, going off of that, and look, you know, I know that everybody on this board, including ourselves and our firm, has a lot of empathy for this. We weren't popping champagne bottles when this legislation happened. We already had a very successful practice um, in our uh, engineering firm with some great customers. And this, the, the, the question I have for you, Jeffrey Rambaum, is, you know, you see, you know, Miami-Dade allocating funds to um, lower income or fixed income buildings. But just like Scott said, there's going to be a, a large group of people, fixed income, lower income, that might not have a, a track record, um, not might not be a cl collecting their associations, and they might get ignored by certain banks. Is this state going to create a mechanism similar to citizens to make sure that these buildings have the proper funding stop making sense <laughs> it would be yeah. wonderful if yeah. the legislature would do such a thing and i've heard different discussions regarding the need i have not heard anything regarding anybody drafting something to make that happen i don't know if anybody else on the panel has but i certainly haven't just in case there hasn't been anyone who's actually started their first reserve study, would you like to say something um, from um, from J.R. Fraser's standpoint? Yeah. Who are you speaking to, Peggy? Uh, uh, sorry, did you want me to say something? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. yes. What are you seeing in the industry? Yeah. Well, I'm just going to share a couple of quick stories. Uh, before all of this happened, C, you know, CIA um, hired lobbyists to talk to these people, and supposedly there are engineers and reserve people on our side talking with these legislators. And they didn't listen to any of them, and they came out with that special session. So a part of me is not hopeful that anything's going to change as much as I would like it for the change. And then secondly, I, I did listen to a seminar that was uh, attended by, you know, a couple of our legislators and, and they were very, very direct about it. And, and, and here's a statement because a gentleman said, well, we got a $3 million seawall and we're not sure whether we can afford this or not. So that legislature is very, very clear about his answer. His answer was, well, either she can for, and, and, she ref and he actually referred to an 80 year old single woman living on her own that can't afford it. She goes, either she affords that, or we see an $80 million building go down and 150 people die. And that's where it ended. So that's how strict they seem to be when they're talking about this. But it's just the way they're addressing this. Now, we, we, are, we are very, very busy. Um, we've also been telling people to wait until the new legislation's come out before you start to pursue this structural integrity reserve study for the mere reason that if further changes are actually made, then they're gonna to have to re-revise that report and spend money. Okay. Thank and you need, and so, uh, and so uh, it, it, it disappoints me, Jeff, that you were saying that they're probably not gonna do anything. Um, it's gonna be another year of uh, anguish for all kinds of people because people are winging it. Um, people are very busy. I know, and I can't get an engineer for the life of me to pick up a phone. They're, that's how busy they are. Um, we're really busy as well, but we're just trying to do the best we can with our customers. But we do recommend start funding this. So, all of this is not nonsense. It's just 30 years too late. 
when inflation has just shot off the roof. That's the problem. The, 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 what they're actually proposing, so all these years, people bought into these communities thinking they can afford to live there. And they couldn't. So some of this needs to change because people who are buying into these places, there's something called reserves and, and you, you've got to pay for that. It's your fair share for living there today, not for tomorrow's replacements. I said, get it out of your head. It's, it's for tomorrow. You're here, your friends just drove on the asphalt, just took out $3 off of that. Go and put that into the pot. So I'm, I'm being very clear about it. But the best part about it is that every year we get a lot of pushback from board members. We're getting a lot less pushback because I believe everybody now knows that we have to follow what the laws are going to be. So um, I guess I would still say wait till March or April of this year and see if anything changes. If not, then I, I would say that we need to start running with the ball and, and then doing what we need to to be in compliance. I, I still can't see the end of 2024 being able to, uh, I, I don't see that deadline working. I, I, that's just my professional opinion. I just, I just can't see it. I can't see us getting to any of these things. Um, so that, opposed, to, opposed to waiting, another thought too, is to have that structural integrity reserve done and contractually agree that if there are changes and a modification has to be made, that that's also included in the now price. And, and that's something that needs to be talked about. Um, we're close to running out of time. I'm going to leave it with one thought before I turn it over to Peggy. The fact of the matter is, is that these laws are changing faster than cell phones. And unfortunately, in Florida, there's more sharks inland than there are in the waters. OK, so please make sure that you reach out to your professionals, your bankers, your insurance companies, your property management, and of course, more than ever, your legal team, OK, to make sure that you're getting the sound advice. And um, with that being said, I'll turn it over to Peggy to close this out. We didn't get to all the questions. We're going to try to get to as many as possible. But if you do have any further questions, please reach out to any of the professionals on this panel. Um, we're doing this because we want to make sure that the um, that our industry is educated and they're making sound decisions. And we don't want to see people get ripped off. And that's why we're doing this. So please reach out to some of these professionals on this board if you have any further questions. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Peggy. And thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your time and your participation. Thanks, Rudy. Thank you, Rudy. Oh, my goodness. I don't know where to say or how many thank yous to say. This went much better than I ever expected. Uh, attorneys, you provided excellent information. And uh, I'm just I'm overwhelmed myself. And uh, I just wanted to say that I am going to be planning some more jamborees in 2023 to match uh, some of these other announcements. Um, maybe they're going to be a little bit different in flavor regarding maybe managers or management companies, uh, officials, and so on. Uh, hurricane season's around the corner. Look for some uh, classes on that. But we're going to try something different on January 25th. For all the working board members, we're going to have an evening board certification class. Uh, it's going to be from 6.30 to 8.30, so look for that flyer to be received uh, before the week's out. Uh, this is something that uh, we've had requested for a long time. So uh, the only last thing I want to say is, again, we had an unfortunate shooting right here in our own uh, South Florida area. Uh, someone actually died. And uh, please be safe out there. And I always like to close by saying, if you hear something or see something, say something. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.